So I'd like to introduce you to Chris Manchester. Chris is one of our lead NetSuite consultants and is a resident expert in the CRO industry. He has worked with numerous CROs and life sciences companies and really been one of the main architects creating a solution we call Sickage for CROs built on NetSuite. Thank you very much, Jim. So as we talk about our Sickage for CROs built on NetSuite solutions, we're going to keep with the three themes that we've been going through here. The managing multiple solutions in one application. What does flexible billing mean? What does that look like? And what are the types of use cases we've handled through there? And what is faster study execution? How do we make the operations more efficient leveraging the NetSuite platform? So is within managing multiple solutions, like Jim mentioned earlier, when we walk up to a new CRO client, we typically see that they're using six to eight applications across the different functions. The theme of the presentation is to decrease the amount of applications involved in this process and limit the reliance on manual workarounds and spreadsheets. Traditionally, there have been many applications needed to support the areas of sales, operations, and finance. So when we talk about the silos, what we're doing is really representing these three functional areas. And let's take a look at what area each of these areas is responsible for. Within the sales department, sales is responsible for things like pipeline management, estimating and quoting, managing activities, and those activities could be events, tasks, phone calls, emails, contacts, all the necessary tools to manage sales and prospective opportunities. Sales also has the responsibility of signing new contracts. Measuring against quotas and commission plans is a large part of what we do in a typical sales organization. But again, there's no correlation into operations and what's ultimately invoiced to the customer. Within the operations department, operations is typically responsible for project management, often considered study management. So you'll hear me use those terms interchangeably throughout the presentation. Operations is, is responsible for scheduling projects. They're responsible for sample receipting or inventory management. And this is somewhat unique to the CRO industry in that we actually have to tie these sample receipts and inventory management to studies or to projects. Operations is responsible for time management. How are we using our resources? What is the actual performance of these projects? And then ultimately study execution. How fast can we move a project through the execution process and are, do we have the right tools and the right visibility to make decisions? Lastly, we'll talk about finance. Finance is responsible for invoicing, for collections, project profitability, which is often a number one report we get asked for, budgeting, financials, and consolidations if we're managing multiple legal entities within the application that also use the same process. Now when we come across a new engagement, we typically see a few common traits. We see a standalone CRM system does that, that does not automatically feed any information into operations or finance. We see a homegrown or multiple homegrown standalone project management systems with limited insight into pipeline or invoicing or financial results. We see inventory systems that do not tie into project or study management. And then quite often we see QuickBooks on the back end with manual invoicing and zero revenue forecasting capabilities. When we start to merge these operations onto a single platform, which we dub Sickage for CROs built on NetSuite, we start to see a certain amount of values. The number one value we see here is access to information. We see increased visibility across these departments, a single source of the truth when we're coming to a status meeting, a sales meeting, an operations meeting. We find decreased reliance on standalone applications that don't talk to each other because it's either too costly or too hard to integrate them. We have robust reporting because we can start to report on uh, information across these different departments that we may not have had access to previously. And better communication and awareness of upcoming work. Now I categorize these values into, uh, into a downstream value and an upstream value. When we think about downstream values, operations now has the ability 
has visibility into future projects. Finance can automate invoicing and forecast future revenues. From an upstream perspective, sales can view project execution to more accurately estimate and price processes based on historical results. Project managers are able are up to date on financial and invoicing statuses. Now as I go through the, the next sections here, we're going to break this down into a process we call bid to bill. And we're going to walk through opportunity management, quoting, estimating, and pricing, project management, and invoicing. My next slide depicts an opportunity record in NetSuite. And what this does is it starts what we call the bid to bill process. And very simply, the bid to bill process is how well can a CRO organization bid a project, execute a project, and ultimately invoice that project. And the opportunity record is typically the starting point. From an opportunity record, we have the ability to track things like close rates. It provides answers to the following questions. How many opportunities have we closed this quarter? What percentage of opportunities do we close? And what is the average opportunity size? From a pipeline perspective, we can start to get information such as how do we, how does our pipeline look in terms of the likelihood of closed deals? Can we currently present an accurate pipeline to management? And what decision can our organization make based on the current pipeline? The last bullet point about an opportunity is, again, the transition of information from department to department. Can we now have the ability to do early resource planning? We can communicate to operations the quantity of future work coming down the pipeline. We can identify early detection of staffing gaps or overstaffing, staffing, and it allows for a proactive project management for imminent deals. Moving along to the quoting. This is a process we call quoting, estimating, and pricing. Quoting is an essential step in the bid to bill process as it locks down a, a number of things. The first, it allows us to communicate pricing to the end prospect or end client. It allows us to do such things as pricing, discounts, and also revisions of quotes if the first quote or two quotes or end quotes weren't accepted. Price quotes based on price level and historical performance of project execution. And again, this speaks to the visibility across the departments. Does our pricing dictate how we've done historically on these uh, similar type of projects? A quote approval is also a tip typical workflow we use to ensure a profitable pro project. We may allow the business development folks to generate quotes, but not communicate these quotes to clients until the sales manager has been has approved or the profitability is over a certain margin. The second thing a quote does is lock in contract pricing. Typically this occurs once a quote is signed and awarded. Some of the benefits that we gain from locking in contract pricing is how do we execute a study based on what we based on what we agreed upon. How do we ensure the client is invoiced based on the contracted rates? The quote record also establishes a scope of work. This communicates to operations the agreed upon deliverables. How do we know if work is performed above or below the agreed upon milestones? Some of the use cases for establishing a scope of work or a statement of work is establishing how many hours the project should contain. We can define what type of units need to get completed. It locks in some project scheduling, such as start dates, end dates, interval milest intervals, milestones, or delivery dates. And it also sets up the ability to automate invoicing. It defines things such as what are the items we sold? What are the quantities? What are the agreed upon rates? Do we use discounting? And also the frequency of invoicing. Moving from the quoting, estimating, and pricing, like Jim mentioned, we have the ability to automate project starting. 
The project record in NetSuite we also commonly refer to as a study management. And this provides a foundation of study execution. Now quite frequently we see that clients are not using a system at all to track their projects. They may be using such tools as Excel, Microsoft Projects, Smartsheets, tools that are isolated, manual, and not integrated to finance or sales. The first area we want to call out about a project is the work breakdown structure. The work breakdown structure allows a, is set up by the estimating process. It consists of project tasks or study tasks and milestones related to the signed contract deliverables. It defines the executables for the operations team. What work do we need to accomplish in what time frame? It's the lowest level of work to be performed. Next, we have the ability to assign resources. This gives the project managers the ability to make the hours and units necessary to complete the project. We have the ability to use generic resources when named resources are not available. A new theme we're seeing across the industry is the split between project managers and resource managers. Project managers are tasked with creating the project, setting up the uh, established amount of work or hours associated. And this allows resource managers to take a look at the, gener the resource pool and make decisions on who, who we're putting on what job and when. This allows us to staff projects accurately and provide real-time information on project changes and change orders. The next thing a project allows us to do is establish budgets. And budgets can be defined at multiple levels. We can define budgets at the project task level. And this gets into what we call job costing. We can define things like billing budgets, cost budgets. We can also define budgets at the project level, which gets into baseline and variance tracking. And when we talk about variance tracking, we have the ability to do our variances at a certain amount of levels, such as hours, dollars, and also timelines. We can start to tell if we're over in dollars, but under in timeline or under in dollars and over in timeline. We also have the ability to do uh, project budgeting at a GL level. Very important is the ability to measure profitability against projects. It provides answers to some commonly asked questions we get right up front when starting a new project. Is this project profitable? Would I estimate or price this project the same way next time? Are we staffing this project with anticipated resource to maximize margins? Does our revenue match our contract price? How, do, how did or how do change orders affect our performance? Lastly, it gives us the ability to communicate the project plan. Now this communication can be both to an internal perspective. When is this project likely to start? When is it likely to complete? But also from an external perspective we may have an obligation to the client to tell them if the timeline's slipping or if it's coming in ahead of time. Last step in the bid to bill process is the invoicing. Oftentimes we are told by our clients, our invoicing needs to look like the quote our client signed. And that's exactly what automated invoicing is intended to do. What is automated invoicing? Automated invoicing supports flexible billing methods. It eliminates the need for tracking manual spreadsheets or uploads into the ERP system. It increases accuracy and gives finance more time to analyze rather than data input. And it correlates directly with what was quoted to the client. Some of the outputs of automated invoicing are decreasing time to invoice. One of our recent CRO implementations told us that their typical invoicing uh, life cycle was around 15 days after the start of the month. And after they went with NetSuite, it was decreased to five days. This provides finance that ability to generate invoices by time period, client, project, or to be able to just simply invoice all eligible billings. It removes the dependencies of constant communication between operations and finance to produce accurate invoicing. Now a typical workflow we see here is for, like Jim said, the operations team 
which may be chemists, clinical technicians, to enter time, to enter unit completions on what they did during a certain time period. Finance would then generate the invoices through our automated invoicing process. And then a project manager would be responsible for approving the invoice so that the client is invoiced what they anticipated. We find that there's an increase in collection efficiency. As a result of on-time accurate invoicing, clients often find improved collection times with fewer questions. Inquiries by clients are backed with easy to get to data because of the access to information. It also, this process also allows for more teams to be involved with the collection process if needed. Operations, sales operations, and finance can all be involved. And it allows finance to produce measurable revenue by study to tie to, to be able to tie revenues directly to studies. So to recap, to us, managing multiple solutions is the ability to get sales, operation, finance operating under one application and to streamline what we consider the bid to bill process. Next, we're going to move in to the concept of flexible billing. When we enter the CRO space, we find that there's a lot of different billing methods. And like Jim said, these different billing methods can be used in a single project. What we've done is we've defined some of the most common billing methods that we've seen. And we'll talk to a few of them here. The first is time and materials. Time and materials is a very common services-based model where we're able to bill for the time entered and the materials bought against a particular project. Time and materials can be billed as is with standard rates, or they can be given uh, upsells or rates above time and material for flexible billing within TNM. A common theme we're seeing is unit-based billing. And unit-based billing is a non-labor-based billing based on unit completions. Unit completions are defined by the client. A unit may, may be such thing as a study, a document, a bucket of hours, or any particular deliverable. Unit-based billing can be forecasted and tracked over a certain time period. The next is pass-through costs. Oftentimes, uh, we're, require, we're required by the clients to buy things on, for a particular study. We're able, through the procure to pay module, to pass things over to invoicing and again decide to put a markup or not. A project may be defined as a milestone project. There may be certain percents or dollar values tied to the completion of certain milestones. Milestones are visible across the organization and can be completed by a number of roles, including project managers. And lastly is fixed bid. And fixed bid can take two forms. Fixed get bid could be on billing based on a percent complete or on billing based on a certain predefined interval across the study lifecycle. Flexible uh, billing is a challenge across many CRO, CRO organizations, and Sikich has provided a way to be able to use the different billing methods within one study across the organization. The last topic we'll talk about here is faster study execution. Where do we see efficiencies within operations? The first area we can define efficiencies is sample receipts or inventory management. Oftentimes, this is dictated by whether the organization is a preclinical versus a clinical organization. We have the ability to tie receipts to projects. And this gives a holistic view of what material are we using for a particular project, how much have we used up, and what do we have remaining. We can tie search attributes such as lot number or serial number tracking, and also freezer management if there's a certain attributes we need to track about it. We also have the ability to track inventory movements or transfers if material is transferred between projects or disposed of. 
The next area is around time management. We have the ability to tie time to projects for actual project costing. Typically, employee labor is the largest ex expense of a CRO. Time may be related to billing, if we're doing time and materials billing, and may also be related to revenue recognition. We have the ability to analyze variances against budget for time. Next is resourcing. Resourcing allows us to staff projects based on the following attributes. Utilization, skill sets, department, demand, and schedule. Next, from a financial aspect, we have the ability to forecast into budget projects. How do we give operations the ability to manage capacity? Traditionally, project management systems haven't been able to solve this equation because they don't have the holistic view of the pipeline. Lastly, we have the ability to track unit and work order completions. How can we add visibility into what was actually accomplished? This may be dependent or independent on time entered. What is the billing status of those completions? How can we forecast what is slated to be completed for the remainder of the project? And how do we forecast unit completions for revenue recognition forecasting? So to recap, the three issues that we see across all CRO organizations are managing multiple solutions, often siloed, the flexible billing methods that we see with the CROs, and how do we faster bring a project through closure with increased visibility. Thank you very much, Chris. Now, before we move on to um, some questions, I just wanted to take a moment and provide a little background um, uh, about Sikich. We are a national professional services firm corporately based out of uh, Naperville, Illinois. We have 20 offices nationwide, um, and we've been um, supporting the mid-market for almost 35 years. Um, Chris and I fall underneath our technology practice. is just one of many service lines that we offer. Uh, and our, our goal is to really help our clients select, implement, and support business productivity tools like NetSuite. Uh, once again, before we kind of wrap up and hit, hit get, get a few questions, I just wanted to thank everybody for taking time out of their, business, their busy day to join us today. Now, Nicole, did we have any uh, did we have any questions from the crowd? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jim. So we had a couple questions that came in. Um, the first one was, how does this solution manage project change orders? Yeah, that's a good question. So project change orders are a trend we see across the CROs, and again across a lot of services-based companies. So uh, change orders can take the place in the bid to bill process at any point. They can be new opportunities causing either more projects or more project tasks. And they can also be updates or additions to existing projects. The flexible billing module uh, really is independent of change orders where it's just based on either units completed, time completed, or milestones. Awesome. Um, so the next question was, what makes your billing system different from others? Yeah, perfect. So the Sikich for CRO is built on NetSuite solution is really tailored, tailored around this flex, flexible billing methods, specifically in time and material, unit base, milestone, and fixed bid. The unit base is the most specific around the CRO industry, and we've built uh, this the unit base billing to accommodate a few things, to automate invoicing based on those completions that were made, but also to forecast out uh, future invoicing periods. Um, another question came in. So how are you able to integrate um, your limbs into this new system? Yep. So NetSuite provides an open API for both REST and SOAP web services. We often use uh, a 
a, a third party to integrate between limb systems, whether that's completions, whether that's forecasting, scheduling purposes, but there's a lot of integration touch points between a limbs and an ERP system. So it looks like one of our attendees is actually expanding internationally and wants to know um, if our system can handle the language requirements for their operation in Belgium. Yeah, perfect. So NetSuite has multinational, multi-currency uh, functionality and also the ability to handle multiple legal entities within the same application, leveraging these best practices across those legal entities. It has language uh, functionality acro across a lot of different foreign languages and also a very robust tax reporting engine uh, to be able to handle the local uh, statutory requirements of each of those subsidiaries. Um, I think that was all the questions that we had uh, for today. So, you know, once again, just thank you all for coming. That concludes today's presentation. Um, thanks, Jim and Chris, for your time today. And please look for our follow-up email uh, that will alert to you to the on-demand status of today's event so that you can review any material you missed or simply go over it again. So on behalf of the SICH team, thank you all for joining us this afternoon.